Introduction to who I am, you probably know now at this stage, but um, uh, I'm working with Fish Vet Group. Um, we're based in Galway and uh, I've basically worked, I qualified as a vet about um, 12 years ago and I've worked with fish pretty much ever since, apart from a brief, a brief stint about a year and a half out with other animals and I uh, went back to the fish then. So, um, yeah, so I'm just basically... Uh, want to talk to you about uh, just sort of general biology and physiology of fish to give you an idea and then I'll touch on stress and disease at the end which is also important if you're going to be working with fish. Um, this is just a picture, just general schematic of fish and most of them are kind of built along the same body plan. Um, of course eels are slightly different as you know yourself and uh, it's important just to kind of be able to recognise what's normal um, especially if you're dealing with fish in tanks and you're going to be keeping them for any length of time so um, what we pay particular attention to with fish would be just that their scales are all nice and even and there's none missing, that there's no lesions um, on the body surface, that the fins are in good condition, a dorsal fin, um, a tail fin, anal fins, pectoral, pelvic, they're all um, labelled there. And then I'd always pay particular attention to the eyes as well to make sure there's no cataracts or, or damage to the eyes. And finally, if I was looking at fish, I'd always uh, flip open the operculum here and uh, just to see that the, the gills were in good condition. Okay. All right, so this is a, a sort of a schematic of what the internal anatomy of a fish looks like. And the fish have actually two chambers internally. The first chamber is at the front behind the gills and it's separated from the, from the abdominal cavity by a thin membrane. And the only organ that's up there is the heart. So it's kind of squeezed in there behind the gills. Behind the heart, once you cut op open the fish, the main organ you're going to see is the liver. It's usually quite a large organ and it's near the front. Um, as well as that, then you'll see a kind of milky tubes, which are actually the intestines. Small thin tubes called the pyloric cecae are the, basically analogous to the small intestine. And then we have the hindgut or the large intestine as well. And then if you pull them to the side, you may or may not see gonads, eggs or milt, depending on the stage of development of the fish. Most fish will have a swim bladder or an air sac, which helps with buoyancy and ballast. And then if you pull that aside, you'll see some kind of brownish or bloody coloured material along the back of the fish, which is the kidney. The spleen is usually um, buried in here somewhere amidst the, uh, the gut. So that's internal anatomy. Um, then I'm just going to talk a bit about the different uh, organ systems and just give you a quick run through of what they do and how they function. So basically this is just a very basic uh, diagram of the gills and it shows how the water circulates through the gills. Now this is dependent on whether the fish is a bony fish or a cartilaginous fish. And cartilaginous fish would be sharks and rays and things like that. And they don't have any flaps covering their gills. So they have to, to allow water to flow over the gills, they have to constantly swim and then the water comes in and then travels out over the gills. Uh, most bony fish have what we call the buccal pump and this is operated by pressing down these operculae, which are the gill covers at the side, while the fish is opening its mouth. And then as it closes its mouth, the operculae flare and the water are forced, the water is forced over the gills, perpendicular to the gill filaments. Um, most bony fish have four pairs of gill filaments, and they're made up of primary and secondary lamellae to try and increase the surface area as much as possible, a bit like human lungs. So, I'm just go, sorry, go back there. Um, so the water, when it flows through the fish, it actually flows in perpendicular to the filaments like this. And if you looked at these filaments closer under a microscope, you'll see there's actually all these small little extra secondary filaments. They're not really visible to the naked eye. This is more what you see when you kind of, these little stringy things are what you'd see when you look at a fish um, yourself. So just um, a word about the flow. The, the gills are designed to force water to flow over them perpendicular to the blood flow. So this operates a very efficient countercurrent system, um, which is the optimal system for extracting oxygen from the water and then eliminating carbon dioxide. This is a histolo histological section of gills. And you can see here, um, these are the small secondary uh, filaments I was talking about. And you can see there's actually a massive surface area. So in, when the, this, is, this is actually a, a section of pretty healthy gills from a salmon. And if you get a situation where you get a disease, what often happens is the cells of the gills proliferate and the gills all clump together and you lose the surface area, um, which can have serious consequences because the gills are involved in a number of very important operations in the fish. Here's another picture which shows the supporting cells of the gills. They're called pillar cells. 
And also you can see here there's kind of a faint pink fuzz along the edge, which is basically a mucus biofilm. Um, this is quite important for fish because it, it's part of the immune defense system of the gills. It protects the gill cells from, cells from the environment and it also allows the gills to slide over each other as the fish breeds so the filaments are able to glide over each other without damaging um, the other filaments. This is a, uh, a scanning electron micrograph of a, a gill filament so it's quite um, dramatic looking when you see it at high resolution like that. Um, these are mucus cells and it's a special pass stain which is used to stain the mucus. So you can see here the little mucus cells are actually scattered right throughout the filaments. And mucus is a good thing, of course, but sometimes if we get disease conditions like parasites on the gills, we might get an excessive production of mucus, and the mucus can become too thick then as well, and it, it in itself can become pathological then. So we'd often check the gills just for, for marks, but we'd also be looking at the mucus and the mucus quality. If the mucus becomes too thick and viscous, it prevents uh, oxygen diffusing across into the gills, and it can cause some pathology. Now, so in summary, anyway, the main gill functions would be obviously gas exchange. That's the first thing most people would think of. So oxygen in and then carbon dioxide out. Acid-base balance. The gills have a number of cells that are able to pump out hydrogen ions, so they're very important uh, for acid-base balance. Osmoregulation, which is something I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail in a second. And then they're also responsible for partially excretion of nit nitrogenous waste projects, which would be mainly ammonia or NH3. Within uh, the gills themselves, there's also these small uh, kind of independent neurons that can sense oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, um, so they can locally regulate the, the respiratory rate of the, of the fish. So if the sensors uh, sense that the oxygen levels are too low, they'll increase the respiratory rate of the fish to compensate for the low oxygen. Now, moving on then to the skin, uh, the first thing you, you, I want you to look at here is the fact that fish just have this lovely kind of cuboidal epidermis or just uh, living cells on the surface of their skin and uh, this is just separated from the environment by a thin layer of mucus and it's only under all this that you actually find the scales. So if you um, handle a fish or net a fish out, you'll often see scales on your hands or on the net and this is actually told you, you basically have just taken out a clump of epidermis and mucus as well. To get a scale loss, you've actually done quite a bit of damage to the fish initially. So you have to keep that in mind when you're handling fish. They're very susceptible to skin damage. Um, unlike us, the, we have keratinized cells on the surface of our skin or dead cells to protect our hands and uh, our skin all over. But the fish basically just have this epidermis, which is very easy to kind of um, excoriate off. Here's the histology section again of the skin to show what it looks like. So here's the epidermis. There's a mucus layer on top. You can't really see anything there, but it's, it's often um, invisible. But all these cells with the spaces in them, they're actually cells full of mucus in this section. So that's the cuboidal epidermis with the mucus cells in it. And then it's only underneath that, um, there's the, the basement membrane of the epidermis is there. And only underneath that, you can see the actual scales buried in these scale pockets. Here's another scale down here. So you can see there is quite a lot um, in situ above the scales in fish so once the scales come off it's it's bad news now moving on then to the heart and the circulatory system the heart of fish has two chambers um, an atrium and a ventricle but it also has this bulbous arteriosus which is like a fibrous pump which helps to pump the blood around the body so the atrium is very thin walled and the ventricle is a thick muscular um, uh, triangle of of um, of muscle and it's basically that which uh, really drives the blood around the, the circulatory system. Fish like, like us and other mammals they actually have a dual circulation so one side of the circulation is going to the, the gills as opposed to the lungs and then the other side is going to um, circulate blood to all the other body organs and the gut. Now moving on then to the blood smear and um, this is actually uh, you can see here fish are, are different to other mammals and ourselves. They actually have nucleated red blood cells. So obviously the other kind of species that would have nucleated red blood cells, should we ask John this question? A camel. <laughs> huh? A camel? A camel. Oh, I didn't know that. But uh, <laughs> thank you for that. But also reptiles and birds, they have nucleated red blood, ce red blood cells. And most mammals have, have non-nucleated red blood cells, including ourselves. But you can also see here that fish have white blood cells that look a bit like neutrophils, which are similar to the white blood cells in our system. So they have quite uh, similar um, cells to, to most species. 
Moving on then to the kidney. Um, the kidney is kind of divided into two sections, the head kidney and the hind kidney. And this is more of a functional uh, division rather than a physical definition division. In some species of fish, the head kidney is actually, it is separate and the hind kidney is, is separate from it. So it can be easy to see the two, but in, for instance, in salmon, like this picture here, um, it's all just one big long line. So it's mostly head kidney tissue up here and mostly hind ki kidney down here, but it kind of merges in the middle. Um, so basically the head kidney is responsible for blood cell, it, it forms, helps to form blood cells, but it also has a lot of lymphoid tissue. So it's very important for the immune function of the fish. And then the hind kidney down here is basically all these kind of tubules and glomeruli and um, it's also involved in osmoregulation. So all the excretion and the osmoregulation happens down this end and the, the blood, blood forming um, cells and the lymphoid tissue is up at the, the head kidney. So just um, to talk a bit about osmoregulation, it's a huge thing for fish and between 25 and 50% of the total energy output of fish is actually needed for osmoregulation. It involves the kidney, the gut and the gills. And it's, there's different issues if the fish are freshwater or marine. They, 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 if the fish are swimming around in a marine environment, the, the salty water is obviously more concentrated than them. So they're, the whole time their body is taking on salt and the freshwater fish have the opposite problem. They're basically just taking on water because their blood would be saltier than the environment. So you basically have this movement that they have to deal with when they're living in an aquatic environment. So this schematic kind of shows you what happens with both freshwater and marine fish. So in marine fish, they get a lot of water, but mostly salt ions from the food just by drinking seawater and as they're swimming along. And then they lose water through the gills and other parts of the body surface because they're in a salty environment. Um, and how they deal with this is by excreting salt ions from the gills, but also probably mainly in the marine fish, it's massive excretion of salt ions and very small amounts of water um, from the kidneys. So they produce a small volume of very salty urine to help them deal with this. Um, on the other hand, in the freshwater side of things, the fish are swimming along, they do take up some water and some ions and salt, uh, from, from the water, but they're taking on a lot of water from, um, from the, through the skin and other parts of the body surface because the whole time the water is trying to move into the fish because the fish is saltier than the environment. Um, also then the fish will uptake some salt ions from the gills to help to counteract this with the, with the salt pumps. Um, but then the big way that they deal with this is just excreting large and large amounts of uh, dilute urine, um, which helps them kind of deal with, not to stop them becoming flooded with water. This is just a little picture of a marine fish to show the iron movement. And uh, so the red arrows shows which way all the sodium and potassium chloride ions are going. So they're getting a lot of it in through the mouth as they're swimming along. There is some exchange, it kind of that neutralizes itself out through the water loss and iron, ions in um, over the skin and water loss thr through the skin. But the big thing here is the active transport through the gills and also the concentrated salt urine. So that's how the marine fish deal with the excessive amounts of salt that their body is, is taking on at all times. Now, the next organ that I was going to talk about is the spleen. And uh, the spleen and sam salmon, this is salmon and it's, it's just uh, kind of buried in here near the, the hind gut. And you'll find it in most species somewhere. Uh, it can be anywhere kind of around here. And it's usually kind of a dark, uh, bloody colored organ. And it has a hemopoietic function, which helps it basically it's involved in making red blood cells, but also it has a very strong lymphoid function. So it's very important for the immune mm -hmm. system of fish. And there's like lymphoid centers that produce immune cells um, in the specific immune response. Um, so it's quite a key organ for um, immune function. It also has a reticulate system to filter out all red blood cells, a bit like uh, mammalian spleens. So it, it's important um, for a number of different factors. Then, yeah, moving on then to the gastrointestinal system of fish. And uh, as I mentioned before, most of the, the gastrointestinal system, the small intestine, consists of these little tubes um, or pyloric ceca. And in between these tubes, you see this white creamy stuff is actually fat. But within the fat, uh, the pancreas is embedded. So this is actually a cross-section on histology of what the pyloric ceca and the pancreas looks like. So here's the tubes, here, here, and here. And in between are, is the pancreatic tissue, just embedded in the fat. All this kind of airy looking stuff is actually the fat. So basically, um, the, the, the pancreas produces enzymes to help the fish digest the food. And the digestion happens in these blind ending tubes, which, has, which have a relatively high surface area, a bit like our small intestine. And then um, this, everything then moves down into the, the large intestine and the feces is ex excreted from here. So you say those, uh, these 
leaves. There's a lot of tubes I think are, they have a looping on the end of looping or not. Pardon? The sea king. Yes. Are they, do they have a, an entrance? No, they literally only have, they have like, they're, they're like, literally like finger like projections. So it all happens kind of within the tube. So stuff has to kind of circulate in and out. Yeah, it doesn't actually flow, flow through. So there's kind of just blind ending tubes. But they're quite short. Like most of them would be, like what you see there, that's all they are. Like that. So the, the liquid then moves on. And uh, there's absorption through the, through the pyloric CK then of the, the nutrients. So well, moving on then to the, the fish's eye, um, again built on the same um, plan to most vertebrates and we have a lens uh, which can contract and expand depending on how much light is coming in and out and they also have retina with rods and cones like we have, um, cornea then to protect the, the surface of, the, of the, the lens and then the cornea then at the front to protect the surface of the eye. Most fish are visual feeders so their eyes are very important and they have an ability to see in colour, most fish, and then many of them are able to see in uh, UV and polarised light as well. So they have a little bit more advanced than us, depending on what position they live on in, in, or live in in the water column, whether they're very deep water fish or shallow water fish. Yes, moving on then to the swim bladder. Well, uh, swim bladders are very important. Sorry, can you just ask one more question? Sorry, in terms but of... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it can be quite significant, particularly in um, if there's, for instance, if we have a zooplankton swarm in a, that goes through, a, say, a pen of salmon, they can irritate the surface of the cornea, and then the fish often can sort of try to rub their eyes off the side of the net, and you'll get corneal abrasion and damage then from that. And um, what normally happens then is you get kind of a whitish, it, it does heal if the, as long as the eye doesn't rupture, and you get sort of a whitish film on the surface of the eye, which eventually contracts over time. Um, but also then they can get secondary cataracts from the corneal damage, which we've, we'd see frequently as well in, in salmon. Um, so mostly from physical abrasion or from, from zooplankton, we'd get problems with that. Well, would that be more in farm fish? Um, yeah, and I have seen it. I have seen um, well, ca more cataracts than corneal problems, okay. though, in wild fish. But I think that's from, it can be from like toxins or UV light as well. There's so many different things. And then in terms of cataracts, you can get cataracts from a nutritional imbalance, which would have been a big thing back in the early years of, of fish farming when they weren't, especially when they removed blood meal from the, from the fish feed because the, basically the, there wasn't enough histidine then in the fish feed and the, the salmon have a very high requirement for histidine and then they started getting cataracts. So they, they eventually figured out what was the, the missing, prob, missing link. So they had to correct that. But um, I have seen cataracts and corneal damage in wild fish as well, but it just wouldn't be as common. Yeah, so going back, going on to our swim bladders then. So swim bladders are mostly for buoyancy, of course, and also for ballast in the water. And there's a, a number of different types of swim bladders. You can have this dual uh, chamber swim bladder, um, or else you can have just a single chamber swim bladder, like in salmon here. Um, uh, most bony fish have advanced swim bladders, and there's two main types. One would be the physostome, which basically means there's a connection to the outside. So the swim bladder will have a tube that connects to the alimentary canal, so then the fish is able to regulate the amount of air in its swim bladder. So you'd often see maybe if fish are transported. Um, for, I just, I've witnessed this now in salmon. If they're moved in a well boat and they're put into a new pen, the fish start to come to the surface and they gulp air and go back down. And this is how they kind of you know, get the buoy their buoyancy right again after being transported. Um, whereas other fish that don't have this uh, connection to the alimentary canal, they're called physoclists. So the connection has closed over as the fish has developed. So they basically have to... The, the gas has to diffuse in from the blood system. And these fish basically can't, it really limits their vertical migration. And if they want to um, basically move up and down a quite, from quite a depth, they have to operate on a decompression schedule, a bit like a human diver. They can't just come up suddenly. So you might see this if, if people catch kind of perch from very deep and pull them up suddenly, and you open up the fish, the, the swim bladder is literally like exploded inside the fish. So, or it comes out its mouth even, it's expanded so much. So um, depends on the species. And obviously then, uh, cartilaginous fish like sharks and rays, they don't have swim bladders, but they, have, they use dynamic lift to keep themselves up in the water. So basically by swimming, that's how they keep upright. But they also have very high levels of fat and oil in the body tissues to help them maintain buoyancy. And a couple of interesting things about swim bladders, you can also eat them, and they're a delicacy in China. Um, 
called fishmall, and they used to be used to make waterproof glue and also to make condoms back years ago. So I thought that was a little bit of an interesting fact. Uh, moving on then to the skeletal system, um, fish have a skeletal system that consists of bone and cartilage. You can see here just on these uh, radiographs, there's just like vertebral, there's the vertebral column here, and then you can see all the little, uh, the little ribs radiating off. And the, 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 um, this is just a picture from some farmed fish, that's a smolt, which is a baby salmon, and then a harvest-sized salmon up here. And um, fish basically have this skeletal system, obviously, to, to provide body support and to give the, the muscles something to contract again so they can move. Um, in terms of muscles, most fish have this, um, this myotome or W-shaped muscle blocks going all along their flanks. The majority of the muscle of a fish is actually white muscle um, or type, type 1 fibers, which are the sprinter's muscle, basically. They're the muscle that fish would use for the fight or flight situation when it's trying to swim away quickly. So you can see here, like this vast bulk of pink muscle is actually just, it's, it's white muscle, which is only used for, you know, escape uh, circumstances. And then you've got a very thin wedge of red muscle, very, very small amount of it. And this is the muscle that the fish would use to swim um, all day, basically. So it's, it's quite a dramatic difference in size and the amount, but this is very powerful, and it, it, but it will tire very quickly. And again, this is just, it's aerobic, so it doesn't, it's, it's slow twitch, I suppose, versus fast twitch. I always think it reminds me of my salmon fillet. You know, when you get a nice salmon fillet, you see that gray stuff around the edge. That's the fast twitch muscle. So the nice bit is the, the slow twitch, the stuff that the salmon's not really using very much. So Going on then to the reproductive system, this is a highly variable depending on the species of fish. They can look quite different, um, the eggs and the milt. Uh, this is, for example, a sea bass testes. They're kind of like this whitish milt within these, these strange kind of structures. And then here's perch ovaries. So generally when a fish is very much, um, you won't really see the reproductive organs of fish unless they're actually uh, maturing. And if they're maturing, then they can take up the entire cavity of the fish. I've often cut open a salmon, say maybe a wild salmon that's died, and like there's just absolutely wedged full of eggs. Like there's about a square inch at the top where, where the rest of the organs have been pushed up. So it, it's very much dependent on the stage of development and also dependent on the species, what they look like. Yes, then moving on to the, the nervous system. Um, fish have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system that innervates uh, the body and the organs as well. And their, their brain is relatively primitive. This is just a little schematic diagram. You can see here some analogous structures in the fish brain to other vertebrates, but it's missing other structures such as the, the higher cortex and, and that. So. Um, they also have this very interesting system called the lateral line system. And the closest thing that we would have to this would be the vestibular system on, in, our, in our ear. So it's basically a network of canals that run um, along the side of the fish and all around the head. And the interesting thing about these canals is they're actually open to the environment. So water can flow into the canal and move along up and down these tubes. And within the tubes, you have these sensory cells uh, with a cu cupula at the top, which again, it looks a bit like what we have in our vestibular system. And the movement of the water over these sensory cells uh, lets the fish do things like maintain its position in the water column. It's very important for hunting, but it's very extremely important for fish when they're in shoaling behavior. And you can see, you know, when a fish gets a startle and the whole shoal, like thousands of fish move in perfect synchrony, it's thanks to this lateral line system because it's just an instantaneous response. So this is quite important, and um, you'll often see a line going down the side of a fish when you take it out or you see it in the fish shop. It's a sorry, very faint line that actually shows you where the lateral line is along the side of the fish. So we'd often look, if we were looking at fish that were kind of moribund or sick, we'd look for damage and stuff along here because it can really affect them and their behavior and their ability to feed. So that's that system. Um, the immune system of fish, they have an immune system for pretty much like the rest of us. Um, it's quite simple, uh, but it's still very effective. And they obviously they need an immune system to fight infection and stay healthy. Fish have both adaptive and innate immunity, which means they're basically, they have kind of just non-specific immunity, but they're also able to form um, an immune response and form antibodies to diseases they're exposed to. So if they're exposed again, they don't, um, they have some resistance to it. Um, 
Immune function in fish is very much affected by temperature and as a general rule as the temperature goes up the immune, the immune function improves but of course this is going to be within a very narrow range for each species because if you, if you go beyond the optimal temperature for any species other organ systems start to break down and the, the immune system is not going to be much use. Um, fish inhabit a unique environment when you compare them to other animals and the thing is they're, they're completely immersed in, in water. Um, so any kind of change in water quality or environmental parameters, such as a deterioration in the water, increased turbidity, phytoplankton, um, a reduction in oxygen or a change in temperature, any of that kind of stuff can really affect the fish. Basically, the gills are bathed in, the, in, uh, in water, obviously, and the fish is constantly drinking seawater or, or fresh water, depending on what it's swimming in, so it's go going through the gut. And also, the, the skin is being exposed all the time. So I have pathogens written here, but fish swim around in basically a sea of microorganisms. There's bacteria, viruses, fungi, everything. And most of these are harmless, but of course there is some that are pathogenic to fish if they're present in high enough numbers. So um, I'm just going to talk, uh, move on to talk a bit about stress now and disease in fish because it's quite an important area. A fish are extremely susceptible to stress, and, uh, but it is obviously a very important stress is a survival mechanism as we all know and fish need it as much as the rest of us. Um, uh, for, so stress can come in many shape or forms for fish and the kind of main sort of stressor that fish would maybe sub be subjected to in the wild or in the tank situation will be chemical stressors like poor water quality so that can actually cause stress. Then we can also get physical stressors such as if the fish are being, um, if there's a big storm and they're being bashed up against rocks in a river or else from handling or capture if we're trying to net them out of a, of a tank. And then also then we have what we call perceived stressors, which would be things like predators, like birds flying overhead, and they can have a startle response to this. So um, we have a primary response in fish, which is the release of this hormone, which is cortisol, um, and the same hormone that uh, nearly every species releases in response to stress. So the secondary response of t to stress would be related to the effects of cortisol and most of these are quite beneficial. If you have a fish that's basically startled and it needs to escape, we, cortisol will cause an increased metabolic rate in the fish, increased blood flow to the muscle to allow the fish to swim away rapidly and also an increase in muscle energy levels just for that sudden kind of escape that's required in a startle response. Um, unfortunately, this is all positive of course, but if we get chronic stress or repeated acute stresses, we can get um, very negative uh, things happening. So if you get a lot of cortisol flowing around in the fish for over a period of time, you're going to get depressed appetite, reduced growth, abnormal behavior, reduced immunity, and disease and even death in situations where there is ongoing stress. So stress is, is incredibly important. So this is a very nice experiment, I think, that often shows uh, uh, this demonstrates the, the problem with acute versus chronic stress or effects of repeated stress. So uh, basically this experiment was done on rainbow trout and in the tank the fish were the stressful event was to take the fish out of the tank and to hold it in the air for 90 seconds and then put it back in the tank. That was the stressful event. So that in one group of fish they did that just at time zero and then they allowed the fish to recover and then in the second group they did that at three time points, time zero, one hour and two hours. So you can see here, and what they did then, so they didn't have to stress the fish by taking a blood sample, was they measured the cortisol in the water, um, which was quite clever, because obviously if you're going to take a blood sample, the fish is going to get extremely stressed. So after the fish were, were taken out of the water for 90 seconds at time zero, they measured the cortisol levels, and it peaked about an hour or two later at about 25 nanograms per litre. Um, but by eight hours later, the levels are pretty much reduced to normal. So the fish had been stressed, but they had actually dealt with the stress well and they had returned to baseline. However, once the fish were, this was done repeatedly to the fish, the cortisol levels were nearly four times higher than what they had been on the, the single event. And by eight hours, they hadn't come back near normal. So you can see here how repeated stress or chronic stress can have a much more detrimental effect on fish. So all this cortisol in the water is a reflection of what's circulating in the fish. So that's not, not good. Um, then just how does stress affect disease? Well, as I said earlier, fish are swimming around in what I call a pathogen soup. It's not necessarily always <laughs> like that, but this, for instance, is a red line that indicates the level of saprolegnia fungi in the water. So this is a, a fungus that's pathogenic on a lot of freshwater fish, and it's present all the time in most water systems. There's no, there's no water system that's free of this fungus. 
but generally the levels of the fungus is l are low enough not to cause disease. So when you have a low challenge, you don't get any disease because this is below what we call the challenge threshold. If this is below this, you won't get any disease. So at a low challenge, we're grand. The fish doesn't seem to even notice what's happening. However, if we get a peak like this, we can get disease. So what happens when you stress the fish out? Well, when the fish is subjected to stress, what happens is the challenge threshold is effectively lowered. And now we're going to get disease here, 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 and here. So you can see how, how it negatively affects the immune system and the ability of the fish to deal with, with uh, stress. There's other kind of negative effects of stress, um, which can be quite important if you're, if you're studying fish, particularly in a tank environment. If you get fish that are constantly stressed, they might try and escape or have fright responses frequently, and that can lead to physical damage, which will lead to some more um, issues. Then the elevated levels of cortisol in the fish can lead to abnormal blood parameters. And of course, experimental results, particularly if you're doing anything to do with, um, if you're measuring different parameters in the blood or proteins. And then finally, then consequences of biochemical reactions inside the fish. So basically, reactions that are happening in the muscle with the release of cortisol can actually affect the flesh quality. And this can affect experimental results as well, especially if you're doing dietary studies on fish. So they're all bad, really. So basically, stress is important to keep us alive, but uh, a little bit of stress is good, but ongoing stress, not so good. So finally then, I think it just what it's important to say is it's really important to be familiar with what is normal when you're dealing with fish, um, particularly in a kind of research situation. And if people are taking, taking on um, a sort of research project where they're going to be holding, for instance, brown trout for a couple of months to, to investigate something, it's really important that everyone allows a settling in period of about two to four weeks so the fish can be um, allowed to adjust to their environment, but also that the, the person who's going to be in charge of the fish gets used to what is normal and what normal behaviours and feeding um, look like. And they just practice observation and they, they know how to um, see what, what, what basically is normal and their baseline. And only then is it a good time to actually start your, your experiment. So that's my little formula there at the end. Optimal husbandry plus minimal stress or is equal to happy fish plus good experimental results. So that's basically it. Does anybody have any questions? Or if you think about, yeah? Um, basically, the fish have a tail vein like, like most other species, so there you're able to actually take blood literally from just behind, just um, in front of the anal, behind the, the, um, the anal fin, uh, just in front of the tail fin, you just insert the needle and you draw back and you actually, it's the same vein as cattle have for, for taking blood, so it's quite straightforward actually to take. How deep do you go? Hmm? You don't. You basically you go as far as until you hit the vertebral canal, and then if it, and then you just pull back slightly, and the, the vein is just right underneath. So you just pull back a tiny bit, and you just apply pressure, and you get. So you're taking whole blood from the water. Yeah. What, what are you putting it into? It's not obviously just biochemistry. We do. Yeah, we we would we we do we have we usually use either heparin tubes or plain tubes, and then we kind of measure stuff from that. We don't really um, use any other types. So EDTA or or heparin. So that would be it. Well, the, the, the needle is about 22 gauge, I think, or 23, 23 gauge, mostly. Depending on the size of the fish, we have smaller needles for, for, a, for a smaller fish. But if I was taking blood from, say, a salmon, about a kilo salmon, I'd probably use about a 23 gauge needle. And I'd take about a mil of, of blood. I wouldn't take more than a mil. And then you can, they, they do tend to recover. What we do is we anesthetize them. And the, the, the anesthetic also has... Dilate, it dilates the blood vessels a bit, so it makes it easier to take a blood sample. And you can take a blood sample literally in a matter of seconds, and then you put the fish into a recovery bin, it recovers from the anesthesia, and then it swims off, and then generally they're fine. Or at least the fish farmers haven't reported to me that there's piles of dead fish with holes in the bottom of them the next day, so, so that's the problem. That's the